Hello, everyone, and welcome to another wonderful day of chemistry. So today we're going to be applying our new knowledge of quantum mechanics to an atom. And so we're going to go ahead and use the Bohr atom as a starting point. And what we can do is try and imagine an electron moving around <clears throat> in a circular path around a nucleus. And if we kind of use the Bohr model as a starting point, the reason why these very specific energy levels are allowed is because these are the only ways I can have a dis I can have a continuous wave function because if I have a certain number of nodes moving around the nucleus so if I have say for example three integers of a <coughs> uh, integer wavelengths going around the nucleus you can imagine this as n equals three if I have a wavelength that is slightly higher or slightly smaller then they don't link up quite so well. And there isn't a good way to have these essentially discrete energy levels. And that's really what these energy levels are, is kind of the spherical version of what we saw in the particle in a box. However, just like we saw before with a specific length, uh, with a given length of a box, you can only have specific wavelengths of an electron. The same thing goes with the nucleus, is that only very specific wavelengths are going to be allowed, which means only specific energy levels are going to be allowed. However, this is kind of the point at which the Bohr model starts to break down because it assumes that we're moving in a circular path around a, around a nucleus. It does ignore several key features. First of all is the three-dimensional movement. And second of all is the fact that, well, we have a little bit more fuzziness when we're dealing with wave functions. So again, when we're talking about the Bohr model, we're really describing the system in orbits, kind of this nuclear idea. And so when you hear orbits, you think about this planetary model, electrons moving in a circular, circular path. Each orbit has a different radii and a different, new, uh, and a different energy. However, when we go to orbitals, we're invoking quantum mechanics. So these have a three-dimensional probability map. So the electron exists kind of everywhere in space, but we're typically going to represent it in a, uh, using a shaded in area, which kind of shows where we have a 95% probability of finding the electron. And different orbitals are going to have different shapes. So let's go ahead and try and figure out what helps define our orbitals. And here's where I apologize because we define these uh, hydrogenic orbitals using something a little messy called the Schrodinger equation. So the basic idea of a Schrodinger equation is I take an operator called the Hamiltonian, which is more or less a big messy equation. I apply it to my wave function, which contains all the information I could ever need about my orbital. And what I get is my wave function back with a single numerical value in front. And this gives me my energy. So the actual form of the Hamiltonian is a little bit messy. It can, it's made up of two key constituents. The first part is a kinetic energy term, which is based on Planck's constant, the mass of the electron. And this is called the Laplacian, which is just the fancy way of saying we take a whole bunch of second derivatives, which is more or less a way of mapping out the velocity or acceleration of the electron. So we can go ahead and look at that wave function and use, this uh, use these derivatives to help figure out exactly how fast the electron is moving, and thus its speed, momentum, and energy. The second term is called the potential energy. And the problem is the potential energy term depends on a whole bunch of things, mostly where, uh, what type of nuclei I have, but also where other electrons are at. And this becomes a very hard term in practice to map out. But the key feature is that I have these two different functions and I apply them to my wave function. And what I pop out is a kinetic energy term and a potential term. I add them together and I get the total energy of the electron. So a couple key features I wanna emphasize. The potential energy more or less is going to refer to the attraction of the electron to the nucleus and in general is going to be negative. And in this case, negative is favorable because electrons are lazy. They want to go downhill in energy and stay there. So negative, good, favorable. 
The kinetic energy, however, involves movement and movement takes work. So this is always gonna be positive or unfavorable. The electrons are going to wanna have a lot of negative potential energy and very little movement to accomplish it. And so these two things are gonna become very balanced and I'll try and bring them up as we go along. Now, earlier we talked about how a wave function could exist in three dimensions based on X, Y, and Z directions when I'm talking about a particle in a box. However, turns out you need to use something called spherical coordinates. The big important part about spherical coordinates is they really tell us how an object moves, well, along a sphere. And it uses three key dimensions. The first one is going to be R, which is simply how far the electron is from the nucleus. And this is really going to, uh, to dominate a lot of that potential energy term because the electron is going to be one of want to be as close as possible. That will give us a very good negative potential energy term because the electron is going to say, hey, I want to hang out with you. Don't make me go anywhere. And the second key part is called the spherical harmonics. That's this Y term. And it's based on theta and phi. And really what it's going to be telling us is how the electron is moving around the nucleus. So it is largely dominated by kinetical, kinetic energy terms. So if I've got a lot of movement, this is going to be unfavorable because I have to keep moving around the nucleus instead of spending time near it. So we're going to, so electrons are going to tend to want to do as little movement around the nucleus as possible and stay as close as possible. Now, it, it is worth noting that these actual mathematical functions get really messy. So we tend to shorthand them and give them a shorthand notation. Uh, which are usually described with three what we call quantum numbers. And one of the reasons why they're called quantum numbers is they have to have discrete values. So one is one that we've seen before. It's the principal quantum number, n. And just like before, it's going to mostly refer to the energy. But we now have two different numbers. The next one is l. It's the orbital angular momentum number. So it's really going to be telling us how we're moving about the electron, larger l, more kinetic energy movement, little less favorable. And then m sub l, which is going to be the magnetic quantum number. And it's going to tell us a lot about which direction this angular momentum is. So let's go ahead and look at these three principal quantum numbers. And one of the things I want to emphasize is I'll occasionally be bringing up this r term to really show how close the electron is to the nuclei. Because again, this will help inform a lot of other properties we talk about later. So remember this radial distribution. Uh, it's going to become important as we go on. So let's go ahead and look at these three quantum numbers for the our hydrogenic atoms. So when I'm looking at my hydrogenic atom, so again, if I only have one electron, the energy will only depend upon this principal quantum number. And what we're going to see is that this n, just kind of like it did for uh, a particle in a box dictates the size of the orbital and the energy. The larger the n value, <clears throat> uh, and so what we're going to find is that just like for the uh, particle in a box, n has to have some integer values because in these in-between values, more or less we have this electron wave interference. So it can have values of one, two, three, four, five, pretty much any positive integer. And if orbitals share an n value, they're said to be degenerate, as they'll share the same energy. And uh, orbitals that have the same n value are also uh, said to have occupied a single shell. So any electrons that have the same uh, n value or same energy all exist within the same orbital shell. Now, one of the key features is n increases, so will the energy and distance, as well as what we're going to call radial nodes. So as n increases, I go from a 1 n equals 1 to an n equals 2 electron, and the orbital becomes much bigger, and we're going to have essentially a node in between. So remember when you had a particle in a box, we had that area of zero probability. It could be inside on one side or the other. Happens the same way here, but now we're looking as it moves out. So as n increases, we're going to slowly be introducing new nodes. So we're going to have some probability 
density inside that node and some outside. And this keeps going as we keep on adding on ends. So going from one to two to three. <clears throat> and one of the other key features is because the size of our orbitals increase as n increases, so will the number of different orbitals that can fit in. So if n equals one, there's only really one orbital that can happen. However, when n equals two happens, there's a little bit more ways I can shove, elect uh, shove orbitals into this same energy level. And we do that using the angular quantum number. So L is going to describe the shape of the orbital, but another good way of thinking about it is it describes how much side-to-side -side movement I have. So either I can have no side-to-side -side movement and the electron will be located evenly every in every direction, or it can occur essentially along a single vector or split up in multiple vectors. And uh, this L value can range anywhere from zero to N minus one. So when I'm at my lowest energy level, one, the only possible L value is zero. If N equals three, I can have th uh, three different values, zero, one, or two. So a good way to think about it, N tells you how many L values you can have. So each L value is going to be referred to as a different subshell. So anybody who shares L values belongs to the same subshell. And as I said before, one of the other key features is it describes the kinetic energy of the electron. The larger the L, the faster the electron is moving side to side. And uh, we see this in terms of directional movement. If L is zero, even in all directions, if L is one, it moves side to side in one direction. And if it moves side, if L is two, it moves side to side in two directions. And this generates what we call angular nodes. So L is zero, there's no angular nodes, exist equally in all directions. L equals one, I have one angular node. There is one direction where I've got no uh, probability density. So in this case, along this Z axis or this YZ plane. And if L equals two, it doesn't exist in two directions. So along this X axis or this Z axis, either direction, no electrons, all others, the electron can exist. So we can go ahead and shorthand these with, a, uh, we can illustrate how these work using our quantum numbers. So L equals one, there's only one possible subshell because there's only one possible L value, zero. And we call, uh, orbitals with an L of zero, the S subshell. If the uh, N equals two, I have two different subshells. I can have an L of zero or one. And again, if L equals one, we call this the P subshell. If N equals three, I can have three separate subshells, S, P, or D, where D means that L equals two. And we can continue this n equals four, we now introduce an f stub shell where f where l equals three. And when n equals five, we introduce an h sub shell. <laughs> Sorry, we introduce a g sub shell where uh, l equals four. And this can kind of go uh, further on, but it turns out that no electrons really uh, occupy any sub shell greater than f. So these are going to be our main subshells we look at. Now, one of the other key features of L, of L in this uh, orbital angular momentum is it also informs our third quantum number, the magnetic quantum number, which essentially it describes the orientation of the orbital. Because again, L tells me how many different directions um, the uh, orbital faces, M sub L tells me which directions it faces. And consequently, it depends on how much of that kinetic energy I have before I know which direction it's pointed in. And it can have values essentially in between negative L and L. And the number of M sub L really is gonna help show us how many orbitals are present in any given subshell. So how many different places can I put an electron? So if L equals zero, M sub L has to be zero because I have uh, the electron exists in all given directions. So it exists in all given directions. 
if L equals one, M sub L can equal minus one, zero, or plus one. So a good way to think about this is it can be moving forwards, backwards, or in essentially a different plane. So forwards, backwards, or essentially in and out. So you can't see it with a magnetic field. And since we use magnetic fields to observe this, the reason it's called magnetic quantum number. When L becomes two, we now introduce an M sub L value of negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two, and so on and so forth. When we go to L equals three, we go from negative three to three. Now, one of the key features that is really important is that this tells us how many orbitals are present in any of these subshells. So when L equals zero, I only have one orbital. When L equals one, I've got three orbitals, one, two, three. When I've got uh, L equals two, I have five orbitals, one, two, three, four, five. So this is often represented by I have a number of, or the number of orbitals possible is going to be equal to twice L plus one. So this tells us the various uh, quantum numbers we can work with. Next time, we're going to be looking in a little bit more detail at what these uh, individual orbitals actually look like. Until then, take care.